Charles Dickens must have had some enormously supportive friends, because when he announced the plot of his 13th novel, Great Expectations, to be about a young man struggling to rise through British society whilst beset by the inequities of Victoria and London, it seems odd to me that none of his chums took that opportunity to point out the remarkable similarity to the plot of David Copperfield, itself already essentially Dickens' own glamorised autobiography. Dickens' own argument would have been that the character of both young men is quite different, but that becomes a fairly weak argument when you remember that these aren't even the only two projections of this theme. On top of Great Expectations and David Copperfield as first-person narratives, we have Oliver Twist and Nicholas Nickleby in the third person, and the admittedly different stories of Dombey and Son and Martin Chuzzlewit just happen to have earnest young men as supporting characters. Even A Christmas Carol could be viewed as the same story but further on, an ambitious young man who took an increasingly dark path. Still, even if Charles Dickens had a few recurring childhood issues to work out, between 1860 and 1861, write it, he did. And thank goodness he didn't have a friend as miserable as me, because it's one of his best. Great Expectations is a Bill Nunn's Roman, a coming-of-age drama about a boy who becomes a man. It has a standard story arch of growth represented by life lessons, as well as a normal series of firsts. First kiss, first love, first fight, first job. And eventually comes to the reassuring conclusion that there's more to happiness than money, like friends, family, and integrity. One of the more obvious themes within the book is the satirisation of the social strata present in Victoria and London at the time. Arguably, the book examines all tiers of wealth, from the subclass represented by the escaped convicts to the impressively posh Miss Havisham. Through the lens of Pip's hyper-developed social conscious, stand fast the sins he commits through his feelings of social inferiority, we learn that the rich are in fact no better than the poor. They are neither more moral, nor more generous. In fact, arguably, the characters that best represent those two values are the blacksmith Joe Gargery and the convict Magwitch. More on him later. It's important to note, however, that this isn't really an examination of the class system, but of the divide between rich and poor, with a heavy focus on aspirationally middle class. No one in the book is genuinely aristocratic. All have made or lost their money in the world of mercantile trading. Even the imperious Miss Havisham is only rich in her connection to the local brewery, so beware of calling this a satire on class. It's a little insubstantial to dwell on, but it's worth at least being aware of the motif of duality which threads through this book. There are two convicts, two young gentlemen, two benefactors, two shrew-like females, and two significant love interests. Whether that's coincidence, or a commentary on our potential to take more than one path, is debatable. If you're watching this because you need to write an essay, then one trope it is worth being aware of without overly focusing on is the Estella means star theme. This is the idea that Dickens used the name Estella, Latin for star, because the character represents an untainable ideal for Pip, or less arcanely, simply because stars are cold and beautiful. A clever idea that has been parroted so many times that it's utterly played out. And if you mention it in your essay as if it's just occurred to you, then at best you'll come across as a rather tired, unoriginal thinker, and at worst as someone happy to substitute any old cliché for actual critical analysis. If you are going to bring it up, I suggest you bring it up to criticise, Better instead to talk about Dickens' use of names generally, which tend to be either suggestive, an obvious use of puns, hence the weak but at least genuinely Dickensian hypothesis that Havisham is half a sham in her hypocrisy. In fact, more worthy of comment would be the absence of the absurd in the name Joe Gargery, which renders him a sort of saint in a world of abnormally eccentric caricatures. If you must have a theory about Estella, a more intriguing and less widely quoted one is the idea that she represents a personification of Dickens' own frustration. In 1857, Dickens met Ellen Turner, or Nell, a fresh-faced 17-year-old actress with whom he became immediately smitten. Dickens had married young, and by now the glamour of his marriage had thoroughly worn off. 
course, we can't especially blame Nell for being reluctant to sleep with this probably rather smelly giant of <laughs> Victorian literature, more than 25 years her senior. In fact, we owe her more than one debt of gratitude, because one of the recurring criticisms of early Dickens regards his significantly two-dimensional female characters, who are almost all either caricatures or insufferably perfect and virtuous young women. Nell, however, was intelligent, vivacious and determined, and after he meets her, we see Dickens' representation start to change, first in Great Expectations, then Our Mutual Friend, and finally in Edwin Drood. Unfortunately, Dickens died before that misogyny was perfectly diluted, but still, thanks Nell. The book ends with Pip meeting Estella once more, both of them now rather older and wiser. And it finishes with the deliciously ambiguous line, I saw no shadow of another parting from her. And so we are left with a hint that they ended up together. And a hint was probably all that Dickens wanted to give. Because, although that is certainly what the readers of the time wanted, and several of his friends campaigned hard for when they read the draft, it wasn't the original ending that Dickens had penned. His more melancholic original had Pip single and Estella quietly remarried. Charles was a great author, and obviously he occasionally felt that his need to be populist was a detriment to his craft. Personally, I am quite content with the ending, but by all means succumb to the urge to write a better one in the commentary below, if you wish. Goodbye.